God day, blessed people of God, how y'all doing? Welcome to another Kingdom Movement Bible Study where God's been blessing us to discuss the woman of Canaan's faith. This will be part three of our lesson. Lord said the same, as soon as we finish this, I would like for y'all, if you can, give me uh, some, uh, some updates in the comment section. Let me know what you learned. Let me know what you enjoyed. Let me know what you have questions about. If not, then Lord said the same, I will see y'all in the next lesson. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit more in the book of Matthew. I want to open up with prayer, immediately get into the scriptures, and as we always do, uh, scripture by scripture, verse by verse, breakdown. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for blessing us today. We thank you, God, for one more time, one more opportunity to not only open up your holy word, but to get a chance to commune with you. God, the scriptures are here for our learning. Your word says in Romans 15 and 4 that these things were written beforehand for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So God, we thank you in advance for the victory. We thank you in advance for the blessing. We thank you, God, for all that you have blessed us to experience up until this point that we may hear from our God and Savior. I ask God in the name of Jesus that you will bless your people, that you will speak to me, that you may speak through me, that they may be blessed, that I may also be blessed in the process. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew, the 15th chapter. And we're going to read, we're going to start at verse uh, 26 for the sake of today. Uh, last week I didn't, I left y'all on a cliffhanger, but let's just say we'll finish up everything today. Uh, Matthew chapter 15 verses 26 through 28 reads as such. <clears throat> but he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. So we've been discussing the woman of Canaan's faith. A few things we discussed is that she is not a Jew. She's not an Israelite. She's a, a woman of Canaan. Not, not from Canaan in regards to her identity, but a woman of Canaan. You know, she's a, a, a pagan, so to speak. She has her own God. But her own God has been unable to heal her demon-possessed daughter. We discussed these three tests that she's gone through so far. She's gone through the silence test with Jesus. <clears throat> she comes to Jesus. She says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed in chapter 15, verse 22. And Jesus doesn't answer her a word. We call that the, the silence test. And that dealt with <clears throat> rejection. And we, we ask the question, how do you respond when God is silent on you? when the word doesn't utter or mutter a word. So we saw that that first test dealt with rejection. Even though she was in the vicinity of God, in the presence of God, so to speak, she did not get a response from God. And at times we feel that way. We pray and we, 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 we do our best to consult with our God and Savior. We do our best to, to be open and honest with God, our Father. But he, he seems to be silent on us at times. So we talked about how the first test dealt with rejection. But then we go to the subordinate test. The subordinate test is when Jesus gives her a response after she says, Lord, help me. Uh, she, Jesus says that it's not me. that uh, He didn't come except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is also after uh, the disciples said, send her away for she cries out after us. And in the subordinate test, Jesus prioritizes, not superioritizes, but prioritizes those of the, of the Israelites, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, over the Gentiles. And we discussed how, while Jesus said that, he wasn't necessarily saying she wasn't important. He was just saying that she was not priority number one. And in that subordinate test, excuse me again, in the subordinate test, it was her putting herself in a position to be underneath uh, Jesus' teaching, Jesus' structure. Uh, no matter what Jesus would say, she was going to yield to it. To be subordinate is to put yourself underneath someone that is higher or chief in rank or to, to, to submit your will to their will. And then we discussed the subliminal test. And the subliminal test is when Jesus says, you know, he talks about the, the, the children's bread. And she responds to the children's bread talking about eating the crumbs from the master's table. And that subliminal test, uh, actually go back, the subordinate test is when she passes the subordinate test with worship. She, she passes that test 
with worship. She begins to worship God. She falls at his feet. And uh, verse 22, verse 21, 22, she cries to Jesus. And then verse 25, she came to Jesus and she began to worship him. She falls at his feet and she begs and she pleads Jesus. She begins to proskuneo him, proskuneo him. And when she proskuneos him, she begins to fall at his feet and cry and begin to give her life in total devotion and submission unto him. And throughout that time, then we get to the, the subliminal. The subliminal test was when Jesus mentioned what I said previously. And what's important about that is that uh, proscuneo, that's rooted in a, do a, a dog licking his master's hand. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen a dog, a real humble dog, it'll kneel down and it, it licks the owner's hand because it's so, it's so humble before their master. And what she was saying was, I'm submitting myself unto you. So when Jesus says that to her in regards to, it's not me to give the children's, uh, the children's bread to the little dogs. And her response, she gets right to the heart of Jesus Christ. And if we don't understand the language, we'll miss that Jesus was actually saying that she is a child of endearment. That he does have an endear love for her. It's not that God was just slandering her and just calling her a dog, calling her out of her name. But it was one of those things where Jesus was using the subliminal message that only those who are privy to the to the language were able to understand. So God willing, we'll finish this up. We'll actually start right there in a, in a bit. But I'm, I want to, if God is favorable to me, to us, I want us to really put ourselves in the, in the, in the, the woman of Canaan's shoes, this Syrophoenician woman's shoes. She's not an Israelite. So she doesn't serve the living God. She doesn't serve the God of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The only thing she knows about this God, so to speak, is based on stories that she's heard in the past and what she's hearing about the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, in this context. So she hears about that. Um, her gods have been unable, or they're disabled, as I like to say, from healing her daughter. Her daughter is severely demon-possessed. She is powerless. Her God is her gods are powerless, but she's going to the one who she's heard has had the power from the moment she's heard his name. He's been doing things that follows the power of God. She's hearing about the healing. She's hearing about the, the deliverance. She's hearing about the casting out of demons and she connects the dots that if he's able to do that with them. Then he's able to do that for me. So I want you to put yourself in her shoes. Think about something that you've been struggling with for years that you surrendered over to other people, to other things. It may have been your, your grandma or your grandpa, and maybe they're not there, here anymore. You may be doing it with medicine. You may be doing it with drugs. You may be doing it with men or women. You may be doing it with entertainment, but it's not working. The best thing to do is to res result, uh, resort to worshiping God. Fall at the feet. Fall at the face of Jesus Christ because that's where the answer is. So let's go to verse 26 and 27 real quick. It says, but he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She says, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs from their master's table. And I discussed that there were two Greek words for dogs. One was uh, kuan, which means a, a, like a mature dog, a big dog or a wild cur. And the other was kunarion. And this word was a, a, a small puppy or a pet. It was a term of endearment, as I said previously. Now, with that being said, I get a little bit more time to break this down. When Jesus is actually saying that he, he, he has a, a, a soft and dear affection for her, he's telling her that she is important. She's not priority number one, but she is a priority. Now, here's the essence of this, 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 this discussion. The essence of this discussion is that the master who she said at the master's table, she's not talking about the children. This puppy, quote unquote, this, this person who should not be at the table is at the table, but she's bypassing the children to talk and commune with the master. Actually, the only reason why she is at the table is because the master has brought her there, so to speak. So the essence of this conversation that they're having is that she has now surrendered all of her to him. She says that even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She says, even though I don't belong to be in your presence, I am still falling subject to you, not necessarily to the disciples, 
Because clearly the children don't want me to be here. But you do. I do not have access to the table unless the master says I can come. So this is the language is so important. But she gets right to the heart of Jesus when she says that. Because Jesus says she's not some wild cur. She said, he says that she's an endeared uh, pet. I, I look at you as someone of a child or a term of endearment. Now, again, Jesus is essentially saying don't take what belongs to the kids and give it to the pets. But she says, again, I'm privileged to be at the table, let alone be able to eat the crumbs that fall not only from your mouth to your table. Look at that. Because in order for there to be a crumb, somebody got to be eating. So the children can eat. The Israelites can eat. The children of God, the people of God can eat. But she said, look, I don't even need all of that. Just give me a little bit of what comes from you. And I, I, just, I discussed that there were blessings in the crumbs. And <laughs> I, I really hope that we can understand that you don't have to have all of what somebody else has. You don't have to have all of what God can provide for somebody else. See, if you just get one crumb from God, you've gotten all that God can give to someone else. See, the blessing is that God does not need to show himself mighty in the major. He can show himself mighty in the minor. God can show himself grand and grandioso in the minuscule. He don't need something big because everything that's in that bread is in those crumbs. But she's saying that the crumbs are all I need because the crumbs will fulfill me. But remember, she's interceding for her daughter. She's not interceding on behalf of herself. She's not interceding on behalf of someone else. She's interceding on behalf of her daughter. And I discussed this a few uh, lessons ago as well. A mama will turn into a bear for the sake of her children. But this the desperate faith of a mama. Some of us in a desperate time. Some of us are going through desperate uh, issues. But they say desperate times call for desperate measures. Some of us have gone to everyone else except Jesus. And all these other avenues have not brought about revenue. All these other uh, places that we've gone have actually shown themselves to be null and void. When we just need to go and surrender all to Jesus. Because notice what's happening. If she doesn't surrender her all to Jesus, her daughter will not only remain demon possessed, but her daughter will die in her sin. Here's the issue. If she does not surrender all, her family is subject to that. If she does not yield all of her own, uh, all of herself to Jesus, her daughter will be privy to the demonic attacks of the devil and ultimately fall in that same state. So it's important that we surrender all to Jesus, not holding back, not giving him 99%. Old folks say 99 and a half won't do. <laughs> you have to give your all to Jesus. So the language in which she comes to Jesus she cried out to Jesus. She came to Jesus. The verbal language, son of, son of David, have mercy on me. And the, the body language, when she falls at his feet, she worships him. That means not only am I saying one thing, you are seeing another thing. And this is why Jesus is teaching us, especially in context of being the disciples in this, to never, po never allow someone to be prohibited from coming into his presence because she's actually teaching us how we are supposed to be on a perpetual basis. I oftentimes say that it's a privilege to need God. I don't think we understand how much of a privilege, privilege it is to need God. It's one thing for us to want Him, and that's a privilege. But it's a privilege to know that I need Him. It's in Him that I live, move, and have my being. I, I, I need Him. In, in order for me to sin against Him, I need Him. I need the light that He provides. I need the air that He gives. I need the strength that He allots. If he does not give me anything, I cannot do anything against him, let alone for him. It's a privilege to know how much you need him. But then when you get to that understanding of how much you need him, you begin to understand why he is, according to Genesis 15 and 1, our exceedingly great reward. Because if he does not, we cannot. If he does not, we will not. And somewhere down the line, she recognized that to the degree she worships him and she renders all to him. Now, in verse 22, she calls Jesus Lord. Verse 22 says this, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. She calls him Lord. Verse 25, Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. Verse 27, And she said, 
Yes, Lord. All three of these interactions that she have with Jesus, she calls him Lord. The reason why this is important, again, because in order to get access to the power of the Savior, in order to get access to the power of the Messiah, in order to get access to the power of the, of the, of the Christ, you have to go through Lord. Lord means owner, ruler, master. In the Greek, it's kurios. It means sovereign master. It is it's sovereign master. It's one that you that you surrender your all to. It's one that you give your all to. Most times, people want the power of the Savior without the submission to the Lord. And that's a violation of the principle. Notice that the scripture says in uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 18 that we are to grow in the knowledge, uh, the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not just our Savior, Jesus Christ, but our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, if you don't have him as Lord, that means you don't have a covering. You don't have someone who is over you. So it's kind of it's kind of disrespectful to only come with your hand out, just wanting something from him, only for him to give you what you want and for you to leave him. See, when he's Lord, that means you lean to him. You 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 live unto him. Here's the thing, your life is not your life anymore. Most of us deal with problems and issues and they have nothing to do with God's power to deliver. They come with everything, they have everything to do with us uh, rejecting his lordship. See, if you are depressed and you have not yielded over the issue of your depression, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? If you are in bondage, if, you, if you're still struggling with anger and bitterness and wrath, if you have a, a particular uh, burden of faith, of faithlessness, not necessarily unfaithfulness, but faithlessness. When you don't believe God is able to do certain things, do you believe him to be Lord? Because if you believe him to be Lord, the woman, uh, this woman of Canaan, she's teaching us how we are to come to him for the power of God by submitting to the Lordship of God. See, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's because he's Lord. When you know that he is Lord, when you know that he is in control, you know, actually, one definition of curious means controller. He is the controller. He is the director. He has the first say, the second say, the third say, and any other say that goes to the final say. He is the controller. But oftentimes we want to snatch the controller from the Lord. We want to be not only in the passenger seat, we want to scoop God over and let us take over the wheel. But that's not never going to be beneficial for us. Now the first test that we dealt with or that she taught us, that dealt with rejection. The second test dealt with, in regards to subordination, that dealt with <clears throat> resistance. Because remember, uh, Jesus says that uh, he wasn't sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that what he gave her didn't necessarily line up with what she desired from Jesus. Um, that was resistance in that particular portion. But here with the subliminal test, this is reasoning. This, this deals with reasoning. Jesus says, it's not meat, it's not good to give the children's bread to the little dogs. And she reasons with him. Said, yes, Lord. But even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. She's reasoning with him. Now that's important because the scripture says, come let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, he'll wash them white as snow. He'll wash them, he'll make them pure. He'll make them like scarlet. He'll, he'll, he'll take away the stain of the sin if you surrender your all to him. Now, what is there to reason about? He's right. I'm wrong. He has the power. I don't. He is, um, he is I'm not omniscient. I'm not present. Omnipotent. I am nothing. I am none of the omni. <laughs> so we're reasoning that he has the power to do it all. But if I surrender my all to him, I'll benefit from his mercy. That's where they begin to reason. Why is that so important? Because if you're not willing to reason, not necessarily with the God, because you can't negotiate with God. That's, this wasn't a negotiation. But this is a reasoning that if I don't submit myself over to him, then I will never see the power of his lordship nor of his, his, his saving power, not only in my life, because it's not about me per se, it's about the one that's demon possessed. So many times we don't see deliverance in our family's lives because we won't surrender. Most of the time, God wants to use us as the example so they can see what the power of God looks like. So if there's something that's not happening in your family's life, stop blaming them and start looking at yourself. 
Well, I thought God was going to hold them accountable. He is. But judgment starts first in the house of God. Am I living the life that he's called me to live? Am I speaking in a manner which is uh, uh, ordained by holiness and righteousness? Am, am, I, am I living a life without reproach? Am I a hypocrite, so to speak? If I'm living hypocritically, well then I'm giving them a reason to not believe that Jesus Christ can do exceedingly abundantly above all according to the power that works in me. Notice that. He can do anything he want to do, but he always allows us to open up the door for him to do it. Ah, some of, some of us are convicted. But that's a good thing, because where there's comfort, there's no change. But conviction leads to conversion. Verse 28 says this, and I'm almost done. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, hallelujah, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed. From that very hour, Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, openly rewarded this woman of Canaan. Note it, oh man, y'all gotta catch this. In the presence of the church, Jesus openly rewarded this woman's faith. I'm gonna say it one more time. In the presence of the people who were supposed to have great faith, he openly rewards this woman who don't belong in his presence. In the, in the presence of those who've been basking in his presence, he openly rewards this one woman in her one interaction in his presence because her faith is great. She, she is, she's literally given the subliminal message. Jesus is actually showing us a subliminal message. And that message wasn't necessarily about her as it was the church. This is her success, the success of her test. See, when Jesus says, great is your faith, in Greek, that's mega supistis, supistis, mega supistis in, in Greek. Megas is what we get our word for great or, or big or exceedingly great, large or loud. It's, man, it's, it, it means so much. But I want you to know something. Notice where she directed her faith. Y'all catch that? She didn't just have faith in faith. Because it's kind of foolish to just say, I have faith. Oftentimes people say, I have faith. And I often ask them, faith in what? Faith in who? Because you got faith don't mean nothing. The object of your faith is important. It, the, the person, which is Jesus Christ, is the object of our faith. So he says, mega supistis. He acknowledges the greatness of her faith. Megas is great. Zeus is, is your, Pistis is faith. Notice again though, where and who she directs her, her faith. She directs her faith to Jesus. She directs her faith in Jesus. Now if you remember from the very beginning when we first meet this lady, she calls on Jesus. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. She goes directly to Jesus. Her faith is in Jesus. Her faith is in Jesus. Before you get to the power of anything else, her faith is in Jesus. Before you start talking about his healing ability, his delivering capacity, she goes directly to Jesus. You will not get anything from Jesus if you're not going to Jesus. She goes directly to Jesus. He is the object of her faith. So, let me break this down. When he says, make us supistis, great is your faith. In Greek, it's big is your faith in me. Exceedingly great is your faith in me. High is your faith in me. Large is your faith in me. Loud, look at that, loud, I'm going to come back to that. Loud is your faith in me. Mighty is your faith in me. Strong is your faith in me. I just gave you seven Greek words for megas. Now I'm going to go back to loud. He wasn't talking about her volume was loud. But the faith was loud. She cries out to him and she comes to him. She worships him. But remember all of the obstacles that she had to go through. That showed the loudness, the strength, the might, the high volume and integrity. The how big, how large it was. How her faith in him. In other words, I know you can do it. Do you believe that Jesus is able? 
She's teaching us that Jesus is able. Not only is he willing, he's able. She was telling Jesus, I won't leave here until you bless me. That type of situation. Look, whatever I have to go through, if you got to be silent on me to make it seem like you're rejecting me, I'm here, Lord. If you got to say that you're not here for me, you're here for the children of Israel to make me feel subordinate and give me a sense of resistance, I'm here, Lord. If you got to give me a subliminal message whereby it seems like you're calling me a dog and making me seem like I'm smaller than what I'm supposed to be, I, I, don't, I don't care. I'm here to reason with you because I'm here, Lord. Ultimately, we see that Jesus Christ gives shows that she is successful in her plight because he says, O oh woman, great is your faith, mega su, pistis. This, you, are, you are showing my disciples how it's supposed to be. Can you imagine how small the church must have felt? Now, I want you to know something. Every time that Jesus says something like this, when he says that someone has great faith, it's always pertaining to the Gentiles. Always pertaining to the Gentiles. The centurion's faith, Matthew chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. The centurion says this, don't, you don't have to go to heal them. Just speak a word. I myself am a man under authority. I have authority. My service, I tell them to do this, they do it. I tell them to do that, they do that. But just speak a word. Jesus said, I have not found such faith, not even in Israel. I like to say, in other words, that man had the type of faith to make Jesus say Jesus. <laughs> He only gets that from Gentiles. He gets that from Gentiles and Gentiles only. Why, why is that so important? The reason why that's so important is because we, as the church, or as the children of God, we are supposed to be the examples of what faith and faithfulness look like. But you got this outsider coming in, showing the disciples who are supposed to be the insiders being there, what faith looks like. Now, if we don't get nothing else from tonight's lesson, we have to learn this, that faith has allowed voice. Man, I almost shouted. I almost ran. Faith has a loud voice. You do not have to tell people you have faith. All you have to do is let your faith speak. James tells us this, faith without works is dead being alone. Show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Your faith should be louder than your talk. Your faith in Jesus should be louder than anything you have to say. See, while I wear shirts to say God over everything or Jesus Lord or whatever the case may be, this shouldn't speak louder than my life. This should only be an echo to my life. And that's how it should be for us as Christians, as saints, kingdom disciples. We should be the, the people who allow in the world to see Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. So listen to this. Listen to this. Her faith was not only sensual and spiritual, but also scriptural. Uh, where do you get that from, preacher? Because oftentimes we think we got faith because we feel something. But what happens when you don't feel it? That's not faith. Her faith was not only sensual, not only was it spiritual, but it was also scriptural. See, it was sensual in that she came, she cried out to Jesus. She felt it. It was sensual. She had the sense. She felt it. She cried out to Jesus. She was, there, was a, there was a feeling. There was an emotion connected to her faith, which brought her to Jesus. It was, it was uh, spiritual because her daughter was severely demon-possessed, which means that the only way that spirit, those spirits, those demonic spirits could be released is if she was spiritually connected to the spiritual Messiah, the Messiah. It was a spiritual faith as well, but it was scriptural in this, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. O Lord, son of David. Where did she get that from? See, when you read Isaiah chapter 6, verse chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, when you read those verses, you find out, you talk, he talks more about the uh, Jesus Christ and coming through the bloodline of David. When you read Jeremiah chapter 23, uh, Jeremiah chapter 33, um, you, you start seeing about Jesus coming through the lineage of David, son of David. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, as well as chapter 33 and 17. Those are Old Testaments. Remember, they're not necessarily in the New Testament. Now, we have the New Testament because it is finished. But during those times, Jesus is in the process of bringing in the New Testament. 
ultimately to uh, fulfill the law. So that's why when we read Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, it talks about Jesus being of the son of David, uh, son of Abraham, that bloodline. So her faith was not just sensual, her faith was not just spiritual, but her faith was scriptural. And this is what I want to highlight. We can't just have faith in dreams and visions without our faith being according to the word of God. That's a big problem. Oftentimes people have more faith in their dreams than they have in the word. They, they have more faith in what some prophet said, but it doesn't line up with the passages of the scripture. See, the Bible tells us to test all things to see if they be true. Prove these things to see if they be true. Test all things. Don't allow yourself to just hear something and be deceived based on something that makes you feel good. You are supposed to align your faith with the truth and the authority of the word of God. Now, that's not something a lot of people want to hear because the word of God is very contrary to our feelings a lot of times. But is it about us or is it about the living word who, is our also, who also is our living God and also our living Lord? Because if that's the case, we submit, we become subordinate to his will and not our own. Now, because her faith was great, her daughter was healed. I don't know if y'all caught that. The Bible says and from that hour, from that very hour, her daughter was healed. Hallelujah. You got to check that out. She's, she's rewarded, but she didn't come there to be rewarded. She didn't come there to be rewarded. She came there because her daughter was severely demon possessed. But because she had great faith, her daughter was made whole. Her daughter was healed. Now what made her faith great was this. She allowed every obstacle that God placed before her to be an opportunity to get closer to the heart of God without wavering. Every obstacle that Jesus Christ laid before her was an opportunity that she seized. Every time that Jesus didn't say something, she drew closer. Whenever Jesus said something that brought about resistance, she drew closer. Whenever Jesus said something that she didn't necessarily like, she still drew closer. In other words, they were stepping stones, not stumbling blocks. She got right what Jesus wanted her to be from the very beginning because she needed to know, Jesus needed to know, the disciples needed to know that her faith was in Jesus, not nowhere else. And because of that, her daughter is now healed. Where's her daughter in the equation? We don't know if her daughter is at home sleeping from a demonic attack. We don't know if the, the, the demonic uh, attack is allowing the, the daughter to do anything that's not only putting herself in danger, but others in danger. We don't know where the daughter is, but we know where the mama is. In the face and in the presence of God Almighty right now. So he, he, he gives us all these obstacles and she uses them as opportunities. But she doesn't waver. This is why he's able to tell her, Megas su pistis. Great is your faith. So the last two things I'll, I'll leave you with this. This is the success of her test. I can only imagine how happy she is just hearing those words. The success of her test is two things. Number one, she's publicly acknowledged or rewarded for her faith. Even though she didn't come there for that, she got that. She has now been justified in the presence of the people by the Lord. Think about that. All that she's gone through to get there. She's now validated, vindicated in the presence of God and God's people. And the second thing, her daughter is healed from that very hour. From that very hour. The moment Jesus says, O oh woman, great is your faith. Let it, be, let it be to you as you desire. Let it be to you as you desire. As you desire. Whatever you are desiring from me because you didn't go nowhere else. You came to me. You understood that the power was in me. You understood that the deliverance was in me. In other words, you came to me for the sake of me. And because you came to me for the sake of me, your daughter is going to benefit from it. Your desire has now been given unto you because now you've given me your desire. Y'all catch that? She didn't take her desire into her own hands. She gave her desire unto Jesus. So if you don't catch anything else, you have to give everything to Jesus. Once you give yourself to Jesus, all that concerns you, you also give to Jesus. Does this make sense? I pray it does. Lord, this thing we'll pick up on another lesson next week. I pray y'all will bless. Uh, for anyone who hasn't accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, 
after you hear a lesson like this and you know that you haven't given your all to Christ, you know that you're not saved, what are you waiting for? This is the moment. This is the time. Just repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe. I believe. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you came to die for my sins, for my pride, my slander, my hatred, my adultery, my fornication, my, my fornication, my bisexuality, my homosexuality, anything that I'm doing that's not like you, my stealing, all my sins, all my crimes. I ask you to forgive me as I accept your son Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. I don't want your death to be in vain on my behalf. I give you my life. And I ask you to take residence and lordship, which is ownership. Fill me with your spirit. Empower me by your word. Empower me by your spirit. That I may be the man or the woman that you've created me to be. In Jesus' name. Welcome to the family. Uh, God bless you. I pray that you were blessed again. Uh, there's nothing greater than salvation. Uh, I live for this. And I just want to say thank you for blessing me with the privilege of teaching you the scriptures. I want to give a few shout outs. Uh, shout out to my brothers, uh, Clarence Talley Jr. Can't do senior. Uh, Clarence Talley Jr. And uh, uh, another brother of mine, also a cousin of mine, uh, KJ Banks. We call him Cash. Cash Banks. And another uh, new friend of mine, he's like a little brother to me as well. Uh, his name is Mark Gloria. I call him Mark Glory. I want to give shout outs to these three. Uh, Clarence Talley Jr. Uh, Talley is a brother of mine. I met him in uh, sixth grade, seventh grade. I can't remember. But I can tell y'all, man, that is a brother. He is a friend. He has been to me what I have failed to be to him. Um, my, when, when I went through some hard times in my life, when I was going through some, some real rocky moments, living in, in the dark pit of sand, he was there. He was kind of like my journal. Um, I mean, he was a compassionate brother. If I needed anything from him, he's like that to this day. I can call on him, and he'll, he'll be there. Uh, and I just want to thank God for him. He's a, he's a brother like no other. And I thank God for you, Clarence. I love you. Uh, to uh, my brother, also my cousin KJ. Uh, I love him, man. The first time I met him when we worked at Target, I, I finally got a job, so I didn't have to do no robbing or fighting for money or stealing, uh, uh, play, uh, playing basketball for money. And I met him at uh, Target, and we were, we, we come to find out we were blood. And um, he's been a man of honor and integrity. Uh, one thing I respect about KJ his loyalty, his commitment. Um, and he saved, he gave his life to Christ not, uh, a few years ago actually. But what blessed me is that one day I gave my life to Christ and I was growing in the Lord. He came to me, he told me this out of nowhere. He said, I'm going to have to start doing better because I see that at this juncture of our lives, what God is taking you, if I don't start doing better, we're going to fall apart. And I don't want our friendship and our brotherhood to, to go away. And I admire that. I've never had a, no one come to me and tell me that I see where you're going and I'm not going that direction. So if I don't do right, if I don't do better, I can see us uh, no longer being friends. And I love you for that. that that's impacted me more than he knows. I love you, uh, Banks. And Mark Glory. I call him Mark Glory. Uh, I love him, man. I met him at the uh, Martin Elf's, uh Christian Bookstore. And I met him there, and he came to me, and he said, can I share my testimony with you? And it blessed me. Um, he was sharing his testimony about how he was in an accident and uh, brain damage, and his mama was praying for him, and God healed him. And to this day, man, he's on fire for God. Uh, his mother was recently uh, uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, and uh, he called me to pray for her. And normally when he calls me, I pray. But this time, he was so compassionate, so filled with the Spirit, he just began to pray. And, to, and now he, he gave me a call recently let me know that both his mama and his brother have been healed. So I want you to know, mama and your bro and brother, that just, uh, your son and your brother, Mark Glory, loves you. And I respect him. He's a man of faith. He's a man of integrity. And he's a man after God's own heart. Again, I pray this lesson blessed you. Um, I love you, Mark. 
I pray this lesson bless you. I pray that, that God is continuously watching over you and keeping you. And I pray that the, the woman of Canaan was able to give you not only conviction, but also inspiration so we can draw closer to God and, and, and be exactly what he wants us to be and receive exactly what he wants us to receive. God bless you. God keep you. And y'all know the slogan. God first.